through centuries of scourges and disasters brought about by your code of morality. You have cried that your code had been broken, that scourges were punishment for breaking it, that men were too weak and too selfish to spill all the blood it required. You damned man, you damned existence, you damned this earth, but you never dared to question your code. You went on crying that your code was noble, but human nature was not good enough to practice it. And no one rose to ask the question, good, by what standard? So that quote was by Anne Rand's John Galt in Atlas Shrugged. At first glance, it seems as though it's an attack on objective ethics, but in fact, it's in support of it. In today's episode, we will be discussing objective ethics and how to justify it. For those of you who are new to ethics, let me tell you what's at stake. The proposition whether murder is good or bad, if subjective ethics is true, are just as justified. Rape, torture, murder, genocide, all of these atrocities can be justified if the person who makes the judgment deems it to be justified or not. This is because subjectivism is based upon the mental states of the agent psychological dispositions in which one agent creates the rules for whether something is right or wrong. So if this is the case, we can say that the people who committed the 9-11 terror attacks were not immoral. On the other hand, if objective ethics is true, which I will be arguing throughout this piece, they were immoral. There is a standard beyond the individual which dictates right and wrong behaviour. And in case anyone's wondering, none of this entails a god. You can be as secular as you like, anti-theist, atheist, and there is no question of whether you need a god or not. So the first thing I'd like to point out is that there is a difference between saying that ethical statements can be true and that ethical statements are indeed true. So it is the case that if objective ethics is true, that some statements will obtain truth value in theory. However, just because they can obtain truth value doesn't mean they will obtain truth value. Murder is wrong might not actually be correct. There needs to be an argument in favour of the proposition in the form of rational evidence proof. So this holds particular significance because people like to point out, you know, can I come to some sort of absolute moral statement, like absolute moral truth? Warm pretzels. Or no, wait. It's the smell of absolute moral truth? Absolutely not. I'm not here to tell you how to live your life in every single way imaginable. And this is not surprising because philosophy is not a complete subject. And there are very few subjects indeed that have resolved all the minutiae of dilemma that encompasses the subject. So please take into consideration that just because ethical statements can be true doesn't mean that they necessarily are true. So many of you might be sat here wondering what I'm going to tell you is good and bad and how we are going to judge whether something is good or bad. What I'm actually going to tell you is that you're using the word wrong. That's because the word morality has been changed over countless centuries. Moral became known as a noun ever since it was translated from the Latin moralis. It began to refer to a story or passage that teaches the moral of the story. This developed over time to refer to certain behaviours and eventually became a predicate in its own right. Individuals began referring to actions as being moral or immoral, as if they contained some characteristic or trait of good or bad. You are right, Miss Bennett. Perhaps I am too hard. It is only in defence of my rank that I feel bound to abstain. A gentleman does not conger. <laughs> This broke morality away from a standard from which it could be judged in the first place. People still do this today. For example, people discuss lying as being immoral or moral. I can't lie! Commendable, Mr. Reed. Depending upon the circumstance. Of course, we now have to qualify the action as being justified or unjustified rather than it actually being judged against the standard in the first place. People refer to their values their notions of good, what I think is right and wrong. This is because it is an object for the individual to hold. A good example of this is actually Kant's categorical imperative, in which the goodness of an action could be judged against three maxims. 
The first maxim is whether the proposition can be universalized. The proposition, it is good to kill people, we'd have to see whether it would make sense for us to kill people and for everyone to kill people. Well, obviously the dilemma is clear. How do you kill all six people? So I would dangle a sharp blade out the window to slice the neck of the guy on the other track as we smoosh our five main guys. This means that if everyone was to kill people, there would be no one left to murder. Therefore, murder is irrational because it cannot be universalized. The second maxim is whether it relates to the end of a rational agent. And this pertains to the happiness or the goodness of a single individual. Tim Moore, buddy. People good. People good. Why is that so hard to remember? People, what is it? Good? Good. Whether you respect the value of another human being. However, Kant never actually gives a justification, or at least a good one, for respecting others. And pretty much anything can pass universalization. So we have an almost empty formulation. This is so empty, in fact, Kant even goes so far in saying, there is nothing it is possible to think of anywhere in the world, or indeed anything at all outside it, that can be held to be good without limitation, except only a good will. So this relates to the good will being good. This means that so long as an individual believes they are doing good, and so long as it relates to an agent's ends, at least in their opinion, it is good. So pretty much anything can be good. Since Kant argues that we should do our duties for duty's sake, and this ultimately is what it means to do the right thing, we need to understand what our duties are. How do we come to these conclusions? What do we understand to be the right thing to do? Since everything ultimately passes, or well, at least most things can pass the categorical imperative, what is the good? So you can see how this will instantly lead to conflict, not just the conflict inside of the individual and their decision-making process, but actually conflict between individuals as they fight over what they should be doing. This is said best in the words of Alastair McIntyre. What I earlier picked out as a distinctively modern standpoint was of course that which envisages moral debate in terms of confrontation between incompatible and incommensurable moral premises, and moral commitment as the expression of a criterionless choice between such premises. A type of choice for which no rational justification can be given. And of course, no rational justification can be given because it relies upon two rival rationalities, yours and mine. So many of you may be confused now because it seems as though I've done the opposite of what I intended to do. Have I not given an argument for subjective ethics? Have I not given an argument against the ontological objectivity of a notion of good as being judged by given agents? Have I not said that it relates to the mental states of the individual who judges it and their subjective rationality. Well, I did give that argument, but it's not something I would argue for. I'm not a Kantian, and I certainly think objective ethics exists. So now I'm going to explain how the translation of morality in the first place has caused this entire dilemma. So unlike moral, moralis and ethicos actually translate to pertaining to character. It relates to the behaviors of an individual not an abstract notion of good. This is why Hegel makes the move to define morality as subjective, in terms of what we've discussed, and ethics as objective. This distinction was first coined by him and relates to a movement back towards a Greek notion of right. So Hegel argued for the prevalence of right over good. He did this because duty became so abstract in Kantian ethics that it was unintelligible. Instead, he thought that it needed to be grounded within the individual, that we needed a reason to do our duties in the first place. This is because doing one's duty for the sake of their duty requires both libertarian free will, in which the individual can do anything in which they want to do, that they can just make it so regardless of the drives which actually urge them forwards, and it also requires perfect reason from which they can discern from an absolute abstract concept the particular action in which they should enact upon the world. This is why Hegel says, From my point of view, the essence of the will is duty. 
Now, if my knowledge stops at the fact that the good is my duty, I am still going no further than the abstract character of duty. I should do my duty for duty's sake, and when I do my duty, it is a true sense my own objectivity which I am bringing to realization. In doing my duty, I am by myself and free. To have emphasized this meaning of duty has constituted the merit of Kant's moral philosophy and the loftiness of outlook, because every action explicitly calls for a particular content and a specific end. While duty as an abstraction entails nothing of the kind, the question arises, what is my duty? As an answer, nothing is so far available except A, to do the right, and B, to strive after welfare, one's own welfare, and the welfare in universal terms, the welfare of others. So let's imagine a very Kantian scenario. To do one's duty is to respect others. Now I ask you, how do you respect another person? Well, Hegel would reply that this is entirely dependent upon your socio-cultural position. To respect another individual relies upon the normative structure of your society. Do we shake hands? Do we bow? What gesture of respect do we give an individual and on what occasion is entirely culturally defined within the concepts and the way of being of your socio-cultural position, of your historical period? Live long and prosper. This shows that there is a conceptual basis, a conceptual grounding, which relates us as individuals. And this is vitally important. On the other hand, if we look at the Kantian notion of good, it becomes unintelligible. We begin asserting notions of goodness and badness in relation to whether we should or should not respect individuals. Should we respect them? Should we not respect them? To do such a thing is obviously to incur the wrath of David Hume and Hume's law. Hume's law is an argument in which says that we cannot derive an ought from an is. An example of this would be saying that humans do eat meat in the wild, or humans can eat meat, and therefore humans should eat meat. This is to take an is statement, a statement which relates to what a being is ontologically, and relate that to how we should behave. There is an inferential jump which is not being met. How is it that one statement determines the next? doesn't. So these are two separate statements. One is an assertion on what the being is, and the second is a separate assertion of what we should do. They don't actually relate to one another deductively. In fact, some people think that Hume's argument is so strong that we should just abandon objective morality as a whole. And Moore ran with this position and argued that good could not possibly be natural, creating the naturalistic fallacy, in which he argued that just because something is natural doesn't mean that we ought to act in any such given way. I disagree with Moore. I myself am a naturalist, and I'm going to explain how to ground the justification of an action within human nature itself. First thing that we must do is overcome the is-ought divide. How is it that we can make ought statements based off a natural occurrence? Am I not describing a being and then prescribing a separate action upon that? Let me give you an example of how to overcome this. If I was to give you the example of a watch, what would you tell me that a watch was? A timepiece? It must have some relation to keeping the time. I could build the statement from this that a watch should tell the time in order to be a watch. Another example would be a guitarist. For someone to be a guitarist, they should be able to play the guitar. If they can't play the guitar, are they even a guitarist? The argument I am giving here is one given by Alastair McIntyre, in which he argues for the existence of functional concepts. Functional concepts are is statements which relate to the functions of objects. A seed can only be understood by its germination and its production of a new plant. There is a process which needs to be understood, an activity, if you will, that relates to the being in question. Without that activity, the being could not be what it is. McIntyre actually says this far better when he says, Such concepts are functional concepts. That is to say, we define both watch and farmer in terms of purpose or function which a watch or a farmer are characteristically expected to serve. It follows that a concept of a watch cannot be defined independently of the concept of a good watch, nor the concept of a farmer independently of that of a good farmer, and that the criterion of something's being a watch 
and the criterion of something's being a good watch, and so also for a farmer and for all other functional concepts, are not independent of each other. So as you can see, there has now been a sliding scale added, ontologically, to the being. Something's being good or bad relates to what it is, because the identity of the object relates to a function or purpose. A good watch tells the time more accurately than a bad watch. A good seed propagates faster than a bad seed. These relate to functions and how well it is performed. So as you can see, the notion of being a good guitarist relates to one's ability to play a guitar. And this has moved good away from being a noun and instead good is far more like an adverb. This is because good now relates to an activity or function. It relates to how well the function is actually occurring, how well the activity is being performed. It is no longer a description of the object. Of course, many of you philosophers who are watching this will see this as similar to Aristotle's notion of good, in which there is a multiplicity of goods. However, have I not just split good into hypotheticals, into qualified goods? These are not goods in a categorical sense. So Aristotle may have said that the good knife is the one that cuts, although I doubt we'd feel that way if we were being stabbed. He may as well have also said the good gun is the one that shoots, although right now as we speak, there are hordes of angry Americans talking past each other about the Fifth Amendment. No, right, they, they are different weapons, John, rifle. and you're lying to these viewers and I'm trying to promote your tell agenda, and you're wrong. And me, I did not disturb tell, you, John. Tell, Let me finish. Tell I did not disturb you, you while you were lying to these people. This is because these are qualified goods, hypothetical norms, if you will. These are built upon the premises that these functions are in fact taken to be good in the first place. Just because something is good at doing something doesn't mean it is good in an unqualified sense. So the question now exists. How do we go from hypothetical good to a categorical one? So here we come full circle to that Rand quote, good, by what standard? However, I'm not arguing for a subjectivist, you can make up whatever standard you like and assert it to be the truth, like many philosophers give today, because we don't do that in philosophy. It isn't actually a good if we can't justify it. And so I'm going to relate this to something else, namely what you are and who you are. So what I'm going to argue for here is the functional concept of man, that man itself has a purpose or function built into it, and that this relates to their nature. Rand actually argues this best when she says, the capacity to experience pleasure or pain is innate to a man's body. It is part of his nature, part of the kind of entity he is. He has no choice about it, and he has no choice about the standard which determines what will make him experience the physical sensation of pleasure or pain. What is that standard? His life. We cannot actually assume what is good or bad for us in terms of what we will evaluate as being positive or negative phenomenological experiences. We cannot choose what will feel good and feel bad. These are determined for us by our organism, by our natures, by our psychological dispositions that we are raised in our socio-cultural spaces. We have been socially conditioned to associate good and bad with certain experiences and these cannot be modified by just thinking them different. So what Rand has done here is related good to our ability to desire. However, Rand would argue that to understand these desires as being an end in themselves would be a mistake. So we could imagine a scenario, a heroin addict who really loves shooting up heroin. It makes them feel great. Of course it does. It releases massive amounts of dopamine into their body. However, can we say this is good for him? No. Why not? Why would it be bad? The only reason that we can say that it would be bad is because we can distinguish between his preferences and his interests. A preference relates to a single moment of pleasure, a particular moment. This is a first order desire. A second order desire is something which relates to all other desires. It is us consciously taking the time to understand our desires themselves. When we understand that our desires themselves actually interact and that we have a psychological continuity of our existence, which culminates in a life, in a story, in a, an understanding, a way of being. And at the end of this narrative, they can either be more good ticks or there can be bad crosses 
upon each moment in which we experience. So what we seek is more good than bad. We seek as much good as possible throughout the greatest amount of time. This means that we must be rational about our decision-making processes. That hedonism will be self-defeating. That we could become heroin addicts, shoot up all the time, have a great five seconds, have a great 10 hours even, but then what have we got left to show for it? We may be riddled with diseases. We may get something like HIV and die prematurely. We may feel excruciating pain. We may feel homelessness and the pains of the outside world of the weather. Mom, give me some fucking money, please. What are you doing? I'm your son. I don't have it. Mom, don't fuck around like this. Give me some money. Come on. Let me in the fucking door. Oh my god! So there is a numerous amount of harms that can come forth from this one moment of pleasure. Is it worth the trade? So my disagreement with Rand, although you can't call it a massive one, is in relation to what the ego is and how we can act on behalf of the agent. So I would argue that the self is not as individualistic as Rand would like us to believe. The self instead relates to the concept of self-consciousness, an understanding of our experiences in which we can hold ourselves as an object, in which we can discern ourselves from the totality of our experiences. I'm making this point because human nature needn't function around the notion of life and preserving life at all costs. Instead, it could function around something else, and that is discernible from desire itself. A jump Rand has made is from desire to life, that the end of desire itself is the life of the agent, when instead it is the life that the agent wishes to live, the life in which the agent would experience the most value, not necessarily an abstract notion of life. To survive at all costs in utter agony goes against the notion of acting in one's own interests, if one's interests involve the notion of experiencing the greatest good and the least harm. We could see euthanasia as being a positive, but Rand could not. What I would argue now for is an investigation in the self. What the self is, is not something that we can assume. Self-consciousness is not actually inherent to our being. Self-consciousness is an emergent property developed through language. It's the ability to reflect upon our existence as an object. So what is the standard if it is not in relation to life? The only argument that can be given is in relation to our experiences and ourselves as that experiencer. As an experiencer, we must evaluate ourselves. We must evaluate what is good for us as an agent. And we can only do that through applying linguistic concepts to investigate our being. This is to show that what humanity is, is far more than simply being a homo sapien. It is not just the material, but it is the psychology. It is the ego. It is the development of mind. So Hegel argues for the development of self through what we call recognition. Recognition is where we understand ourselves reflected in the experience of another. We rely upon another individual to alienate, to negate our experiences. Because the totality of our experiences, everything that we feel and observe is all that we can know and all that we can understand. To go beyond that, we require something other. We require a mind that is separate from our own. This mind that is separate from our own allows us to negate our experiences. It allows us to think, maybe that is not the case. Maybe this table is not a table. Maybe this chair is actually not a chair. It allows us to create a negative to the positive of our experience. This negative allows us to discern objects from one another, forms of experience from one another. So I can now understand myself as being more than my experience of a given moment. I can understand myself as a psychological continuity, as an experience through time, in which I negate this single experience as only a part of the totality and not the entirety. I think Levinas refined this point further and he makes this point even clearer than Hegel when he says, 
A meaningful world is a world in which there is the other through whom the world of my enjoyment becomes a theme of having signification. Things that acquire a rational signification are not only one of simple usage, because the other is associated with my relations with them. In designating a thing, I designate it to the other. The act of designating modifies my relation of enjoyment and possession with things, places the things in a perspective of the other. Utilizing a sign is therefore not limited to substituting an indirect relation for the direct relation with the thing, but permits me to render the things offerable, detach them from my own usage alienate them, rend them exterior. What Levinas is arguing we do with language is alienate the objects from our experience of them. We come to know them as they are through dismissing how they appear to us. We can reject the mere appearance of the thing and investigate the thing in itself. This is what we do with ourselves and our experiences. We reject the moment of pleasure. We reject a given desire and we try to understand what is desirable in general. This means that what is meaningful to me and to you must exist in a common domain. In fact, Wittgenstein made a very similar point on his rejection of private languages, arguing that a notion which is absolutely private, that is constructed of a concept created by a single individual, would be meaningless because we wouldn't be able to understand whether we are interpreting the concept as being itself or not. The rule would not be separate from our interpretation. This means it's, by definition, irrational, it's illogical, it's incoherent. And therefore, to speak of something that was absolutely private would be impossible, we cannot investigate it. Moreover, we cannot even understand it. This means that the ego and the investigation into ego is something that is actually common it's something that exists between us. This means that the ego itself is not inherent within a being, but is instead the construction of a language game and applied to the agent. This language game which holds us all within it is what Hegel calls absolute spirit. This means that when we do ethics and we try to look for those principles which govern our behaviors, what we are doing is actually creating concepts to investigate what is a good life for the individual, for the particular. However, that particular agent cannot understand themselves individually. We understand ourselves collectively. We create categorical norms in order to achieve what we want to achieve. If we do create hypothetical norms, then we have asserted them. We have broke Hume's law. We instead must relate it to the functional concept of what we are and understand that we are acting within our own rational interests, that we must investigate together human nature and understanding. We must investigate sentience. We must investigate subjectivity itself, because the concept of subjectivity is that from which all ethics is derivative. This is why when Philoctetes spoke as being exiled from his Greek counterparts, said that he was a spectre, a ghost of himself, something that was only half man. He was incomplete without the other. This is because he was dependent upon a language in which he was alone to speak. He couldn't build new inferences and test them. He was reliant upon the ones that had already been created. He was a history, something that had been and gone. This is why egoism is ultimately self-defeating. When we seek a self-interested good as being inherently individualistic, we have defied the notion of self. The self is not individualistic. It's socio-historically created. It's embedded within our culture and in our language, and we must seek it together. In fact, the best way I've ever heard this described was told to me by a friend of mine. I am because we are. And on that note, we must seek what is good for us to seek what is good for the individual. The subject will find themselves in the objective. And that objective ethics is how we will live the good life and reach what the Greeks understood to be eudaimonia or human flourishing. Virtue and happiness are in fact the same thing. So here is a quick summary. The movement from morality to ethicos is a movement from a noun to an adverb or an adjective to an adverb. 
This is to bring the function of the individual to the forefront so that the word good can be understood within reference to the object rather than as a characteristic or a trait of the object. The function of the individual can only be found in the function of the collective. The function is discovered through linguistically applying concepts to humanity itself, in which we seek to understand what humanity is and how it can live a good life, how we can live a good life. And what we seek to respect in that is our ability to feel pain and pleasure. This is because this is what is ethically considerable. Our ability to feel good and bad is what we are trying to maximize or minimize in the first place. And so what we seek is the maximization of positive and negative experiences throughout the collective of our lives. And so we create a language game and inferences to create principles which govern our behaviors and maximize the potential of living a good life. This forces us into a state of equal consideration. This allows us to falsify and verify our inferences together in order to mutually obtain eudaimonia, a state of virtue and happiness. And this is important because the end is more important than the beginning. And this is in the words of Aristotle because it doesn't matter where we start, but if we seek to end in the same place, then we can work together to create principles of behavior which govern us towards a desired end. This is why we create certain institutions which then destroy themselves or why we create certain institutions which become improved and become bettered by our critique. This is why Aristotle would have said that even though that we say that certain hypotheticals are good like war, that we may end up dismissing those hypotheticals for another hypothetical like medicine because they both end in the same place, that which we consider to be the good of us all. So thank you all for watching. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and let me know, do you think ethics is objective? Let me know in the comment section below and as always, try to gain some perspective.